Coming to you live from downtown Detroit, this is Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep with your host, Joel Conan. This is a volatile puppy here, isn't it? And Dennis Dick. I've been a penny. I will buy the stock for a penny. With everything you need to start your trading day. Good morning, everybody. Happy Thursday. Welcome to Pre-Market Prep. Spencer Israel, Dennis Dick. Today, we are talking about the three types of stocks, not the three stocks, the three types of stocks that are getting killed in this market. Also, Joel picked a good week to go out because it's been a, a, a kind of a quiet week out there. I mean, we had the bank earnings. We have Morgan Stanley this morning, but it, I feel like it's been quiet out there. So we have some Netflix news. We have some news for Just Eat, which is Ticker Grub. Remember, they changed their name. Uh, news on uh, Taiwan Simulator earnings as well. Uh, but, but yeah, it's kind of quiet out there. Kind of quiet out there. If you pull up a chart of the, uh, of the spy, you can see oh, wait, something just happened in the last 15 minutes. What is that? I'm not sure what that that candle is, uh, unless this chart is doing weird things for me right now. But uh, it's the eight o'clock. Ah, the old eight, the old eight o'clock cross from okay. last night. Ignore okay. Those. You Ignore. see it on FINRA. It's not happening right now. Thank you. You'll always see funky prints at eight o'clock, and that's usually, for whatever reason, some crosses from the previous day hit the tape at that time. Okay. And that it's going to be at the closing price from the previous day, which has absolutely nothing. To do with where the stock is trading right now but some of your trading systems do not take those out i wish they did thank you all right so um you know spy s p down overnight but we're basically <laughs> just off all-time highs you can look at the nasdaq is the same story crypto continuing to drop whether you look at bitcoin you can look at ethereum whatever pick your poison My ethereum's all. not doing well at all uh no, none of them are really doing I, i'm sure there are not to the next, i'm sure there are some cryptos doing well but the big ones are are, are not uh so um, yeah, there's that pulp daily chart of Ethereum. There you go. Not looking great. Um, yeah, uh, gold slightly in the green, um, and oil. How's oil doing? Let's pull up my uh, my USO chart. I haven't looked at oil yet this morning. Uh, well, yeah, there is some some headline about uh, continued tensions between the UAE and and, and the Saudis. So um, yeah, oil down on that news. Uh, Dennis, good morning. Top, top, top. How are you doing? Good. Yeah. Hey, I have good news for all those people out there who keep getting fooled by the tr fake Triple D trader accounts. You killed I, I got verified this morning. Oh. Verified on Twitter. I have the, now the blue check mark beside my name. So all those fake accounts there, if they're talking to you and they're DMing with you and they're telling you, it will take your applause. But if they're trying to get you to give them Bitcoin, make sure there's a blue check mark beside the name because if there's no blue check mark, it's not me. And again, I will never ask my followers for Bitcoin. I don't trade Bitcoin. I don't intend to start trading Bitcoin because I know it's been dozens of people who have been approached by fake triple D trader um, who takes my profile and runs with it. We've had a lot of them removed from Twitter. Most of them are moved off now. But yes, I am blue check mark verified. So again, Look for that blue check mark. He will DM you to ask you for donuts, but he will not DM you to ask you for <laughs> Where are my donuts? I don't know. It's you know not in my email. I, I, I looked last. I actually went through each email, even in the junk email, with a fine tooth comb. And yeah. I was like, I know there's donuts in here. I know there's donuts I, in here. I think I screwed up. I, oh, I, no. <laughs> somebody else is eating my donuts. I, 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 I may have sent you. I, I think I got your email domain wrong. Um, well, that'll do it. It's hot so, mail, though. I, I know. Or you I could know. use the bright trading one. Uh, Here's so right trading I think time. I got your email domain wrong. Yeah, I got it wrong. Shoot. Oh. So, what, so what happens now? So wait, can How I? How do you get your donuts back? Wait, wait. Uh, hold on, hold on. It, it says resend your card. Yeah, I don't want to resend it to the same wrong email address though. I have to talk now. I have to talk to support. I don't want to do this. Oh no! <laughs> For a dozen wait, donuts. Speaking of talking to support, Dennis, uh, you have a story about talking to support uh, at the U.S. government. Oh, my goodness. I've been trying to call the IRS for like three weeks, and you cannot get through. If you actually Google, there's like multiple articles, like in Forbes, Washington Post, that they just literally are not picking up the phone. They're understaffed. There is, they're, get, they're averaging, and said in the one article, 1,500 calls a second they get. 1,500 really? calls a second. That's pretty They great. don't have the staff to do it. So if you're trying to get through and trying to get to an actual person, 
Um, it's basically impossible. So I finally get through after three weeks of trying, I finally get through to an actual person yesterday and I'm talking and they're, and they're fixing my issue. And you know what happens? It disconnects in the middle of the call. And I'm like, oh, back to the drawing board again. So yes, it is very, very difficult to call the IRS. So anyways. The fact that you got through though is, is a miracle. I did. I knew, it gave me hope. So at least I have hope now. So I don't know. It, it's very difficult to get through because you, you get this message. Like you go all the way through the automated teller stuff, which takes like 10 minutes. Then you get through and then um, it'll say, due to extreme volume, we are not able to process your call at this time. Please yeah. try again tomorrow. That's the standard message. And you sure. always get that message. Once you once you get far enough that the automation can't help you and they actually need to get to a person, that's what you get. But amazingly enough, I, I only waited on hold for 30 minutes too. And the person answered, I was like, I love you. I'm actually speaking to a human being. And they're working with my problem. They're working with my problem. And then right in the middle, uh, can I just put you on a brief hold and click? And it's gone. And they're gone. So we try again, maybe today, maybe tomorrow. But you, you what know, it is. You know what's interesting? Uh, I've noticed this is not just with the IRS. This is with any customer service. It doesn't matter when you call. But you can call on a Friday night, on a Sunday morning. They are always experiencing higher than normal call volume. I don't. I. I it's unbelievable how it's always the case. But anyway, let's move on here. Dennis, the three types of stocks getting killed in this market. I can name one type of stock, which is the the viral names AMC, GameStop, yeah, the meme cetera, stock, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, Give me the two other ones. Well, the dream stock. So I, I just tweet out it's the meme stocks, the dream stocks, and the extreme stocks. The meme stocks, it. obviously, the AMCs and GameStops and the Wish. And then you got the dream stocks, where some of these penny stocks, where it's like, oh, I'm going to buy this stock and it's going to change my life. It's going to go to a bazillion dollars and I'm going to you know, retire on this stock. Those are the dream stocks, the pennies. Those are mostly the dream stocks. Those have been getting rocked, too. And then the extreme stocks, I'm talking about extreme growth, the high growth names, the Kathy Wood names. Those got rocked yesterday, too. Kathy Wood, ARKK, down over 3%. But stocks like Upwork. Made new all-time highs. Boom. That is a hell of a... Oh, That is the that. craziest, craziest reversal I think I've seen in a long time. That stock made a new all-time high two days ago on the 13th at $64.48. And it gave up everything that it had been working for in basically the last month in one day. But there is a lot of them that look like this. There's a lot of stocks uh, from the from the growth names that really got hit hard yesterday. So I was tweeting out, this is like the worst all-time high ever because there's so many stocks getting hammered. Yet yeah. the market was making new all-time highs yesterday. And we know the reason for that. Apple, Amazon, Facebook, Google, the FANG stocks. Although Facebook started to roll over a little bit yesterday too. But Google made a new all-time high. Apple made a new all-time high. They're heavy weights in the S&P. IWM, not so much. IWM has been getting hit. And that's a real gauge of where the market probably, you know, really is. Great We're point. significantly, you know, down on the IWM in the last week, you know, down 5 6% really in the last week and a half. That's kind of where the market is as opposed to the SPY, which is all heavily weighted into five issues. And those five issues are holding up. And that's why the SPY continues to hold up. That's a great point, right? I've been we've been, I've been watching this every day. I do. I mean, I watch, normally watch it every day as well. But yeah, the IWM looks ugly, and 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 it's much more diversified because the, the if you look at the spy, uh, let's look at like the the the, the top ten holdings, uh, yeah. or, or you don't even have to look at top ten. The top three, which are Apple, Microsoft, and Amazon, the top three holdings account for what is that? Is that like is that like fifteen percent? That's like fifteen percent of yeah. spy. The top three. Meanwhile, the largest holding in in the Russell 2000, which is AMC, is a half of one percent. So it's much more diversified. So yeah. so definitely a truer reflection, truer of, reflection of what's really happening out there than the yeah. spot. And 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 like so many stocks, you know, that have been getting the beats. And I mean, we're getting the beats here on GameStop here again today. Maybe that's going to take us into our first piece of news last night because last night. Uh, getting broken by Bloomberg was Netflix. Yeah, uh, getting into the video game streaming market. Yeah, uh, not a total surprise because if you remember that they, they did have a uh, Netflix. Did they, they did have that? Like they've been they, talking they, about this. They've done video games in the past. Like they had they have some video games tied to some of their IP. Uh, Stranger Things, I think, had a game. But uh, the the news was they hired a former exec from EA, uh, and also I think he was at I think he was at Take Two as well. Um, and he's going to lead Netflix's gaming efforts. And the, the goal the goal is, apparently, according to Bloomberg, the goal is for Netflix to have games on the platform 
within the next year. And this is not completely surprising. Shout out to Christian, uh, um, Christian Schmier, who's on uh, Twitter, because um, I thought this, I hadn't really heard about this, but he's like, no, this was talked about for the last month. And he sent me two articles. The Guardian talked about this a month ago, okay. and also Forbes talked about this as well. So this is not completely new news, but the market is sure pricing it like it's new news because Netflix blasted off mm -hmm. and is trading up 10 points on the news. And GameStop, which is obviously the direct hit off of this, is trading down 10 points on the news. So it was actually trading worse last night. It was down to 151. It was down as much as almost 10% on this. So it's it's paired those losses and is not down nearly as much now. Maybe they're realizing this isn't as new of news as we thought it was. But um, you know, streaming video games here, definitely not good news for GameStop. If they're selling video games in the stores, it's just no more competition, obviously, for them. Um, it, it's in, I, I don't know how this affects the game makers. I mean, if you know they're going to make games you know they're just another place to play the games right because ea yeah. was trading down on this last night full disclosure i do have position in ea um and i have position in take two and i have position in zynga we know well, i've had some of those positions for a while and i've also got trading positions in some of these as well but i don't know how it impacts those. if i if i can speculate for a second sure uh, right uh like what what it has to do with movie uh test what i say tesla what did netflix do with movies right first they created a distribution platform it was only later that they created their own content, right? So with video games, they're going to create distribution. They're going to allow you to play games on the, on the platform. And then maybe, yeah. eventually, they're going to have their own games exclusive to Netflix. And then fast forward a few more years, and now we're probably... The logical conclusion of that is, oh, if Netflix does it, well, that means, you know, Apple's got to do it. Amazon's got it. They're all going to have their own games exclusive to their own streaming platforms is the illogical conclusion question is are they going to make these games or is it going to be like ea that's making games for netflix you know obviously they're working with ea that's you know maybe the question i don't know i mean i how this shakes out for the game makers i can't figure out you can easily say it sounds good for netflix it sounds bad for gamestop after that it starts to get like okay i'm not exactly sure you know i've been thinking about this overnight but I'm not sure, you know, if this benefits the individual game makers like the EA Take Two, Activisions, uh, etc. I'm not sure which way to go on that yet. Yeah, um, and uh, there are some some great comments in the chat about, uh, you know, Google trying to do this very thing. I I, I don't know how successful Google's actually been, um, but um, it, it, it's it, you asked a great point, a great question, Dennis. Is 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 it a question of Netflix uh, working with the, the publishers, EA, Activision, Take-Two, or going off on their own and doing their own thing? It took them a while to make their, their, their first uh, movies and TV shows. Yeah, and now they're huge. And right. now they've got, obviously, the whole team, and they make some great stuff at Netflix. So, right. you know, original content. So I think eventually you're right. I think maybe they do eventually develop some original content, but and they, then that is competition well, for the game makers as well. I don't see Take-Two trading, Activision... Lower they were trading account. down slightly yeah. on this news, yeah, yeah, but yeah. not getting hit. Like GameStop, like if you look at last night, and you can bring up the charts from last night, you can see quick, clearly on the headline, which broke right at 6 o'clock, I believe. Yeah. Um, you can see if we go to GameStop, straight down on that headline, right. Netflix yeah. straight up. Those were the two direct you know, stocks that were obviously impacted. You see Netflix, same exact time, bring it up from last night. Sure. Um, it, it went straight up, and and you can see the big green candle. That's right on that Bloomberg headline, and then yeah. obviously continued to move up after that. So, you know, the one thing about Netflix is it was looking good before this news hit. I mean, we talked about it on the show two days ago, and I was like, I kind of like it. You know, I was like, it's kind of middle nowhere, but I kind of liked it at the same time. You had a nice trend going on, and now you start to get towards the upper end of the whole range. So the question is, do we run in the resistance, the same spot we've run in resistance in the past, or is this headline good enough? To break us out of that resistance i mean we've always kind of grouped in you know the facebooks and the amazons have been yeah but the netflix, google's have been forming netflix stopped, really hasn't been performing like the others uh, we've stopped talking about netflix because it hasn't been running right but it's become more of you know grouped into that whole value even though it's not value and its p is like 60 or 70 or whatever it is it's still kind of been grouped into that value tech trade as opposed to the growth tech because it's not growing like it was before but you know the valuation isn't as nuts as it was either it's kind of grown so much that the valuation actually isn't extreme anymore you know the extreme valuations we're talking about these ones that are you know companies that aren't making money or the p's are 80 90 100 those were the stocks getting hit yesterday not the netflixes i trying to remember um oh right it was it was a headline it was a, it was from january right they uh 
like they had entered like Netflix had entered like the next phase of their company. Like they 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 were free cash flow positive. Um and what uh they they said they didn't intend to raise any more outside uh capital. They didn't intend to raise any more money. Um and it, I think there, the narrative behind that was like, okay, Netflix is transitioning now from hyper growth to less hyper growth, more stable, more consistent, maybe a little bit more value. If that's yeah, you know, it's kind of like more like a, the Amazon, like where we were hyper growth, and now Amazon, obviously, still not a value name, so to speak, but not crazy either. I mean, and they've obviously kept investing in the company. You know, to continue, you know, the multiple looks always depress or, or looks high on these stocks because they've always, you know, invested back into the company. I mean, Netflix has a continuous, you know, need for capital because they have to continue to produce content. So, yeah. and that and that need is not going to go away. That's only going to continue to extreme as competition continues to rise. So, I've never been a huge fan of Netflix here, but you got to give the stock credit. It's held up fairly well and it's grown in to what looked like a really extreme multiple. I mean, people who were buying this two or three years ago or even five yeah. years ago have been rewarded for saying, you know, it's eventually going to grow into that multiple. And the growth has. I mean, the growth has come. I mean, you're buying this. It looked like a PE of 100 back when it was $100 a share. Well, no, it's not that, though, because it had the growth and the growth caught up with it. I mean, that's the whole point to investing in high growth names is that the growth is going to catch up and eventually the multiple won't look as ridiculous as it currently does. Earnings per share Q1 2019, two, so two years ago, 76 cents. Earnings per share Q1 21, $3.75. Big time, so big time some, earnings growth. Some of that is, you know, they had the wind at their backs. They had, yeah, but if you would have known that for sure and you look $4, right. they're like, when it was 100 bucks, the thing was trading you know, not 19 and eight, you know, times earnings, 20 times earnings, which, you know, is under a multiple of the market. So actually yeah. relatively cheap. So, I mean, you got to consider the growth rates. I mean, Apple's always been that too. I mean, Apple's continued to grow earnings. You know, this is a fun exercise, but if you looked at Apple the same oh, yeah. way. Yeah, here, I'll go, I'll go to Apple. Yeah, the Apple earnings have just been, you know, people were saying, oh, how can you know, justify Apple at a price? And this is like years ago, you know, price is probably like $30 because, you know, the PE looked a little bit high then. But I mean, oh. It's continued to grow earnings at an extreme level. They're also buying back stock constantly, so it's uh, constantly. Yeah, and yeah. But it go back to like five years ago. What was Apple making? You know, um, years ago. A uh, buck seventy is was their EPS in twenty twelve. A buck ninety six EPS in twenty fifteen. And this, these numbers are no. This, the EPS number is not the best indicator because okay. they're uh, okay. My whole thesis. They're no, okay. but their share count is is getting smaller. So wouldn't that impact the EPS, right? The denominator? Well, it shouldn't. Because it's per share, right? Uh. <laughs> Sorry. You're right. Okay, bad example. Bad Top example. Let's go to Amazon. That'll be Top a better line example. Revenue. Forget go it. to Amazon. Go Top to Amazon line. quick Top before line. we make fools of ourselves. Top line revenue. Top line revenue. Go to uh, Amazon. Go to Amazon. billion to $89 billion. Amazon, that's a better, much better example. Not every company is Amazon. Oh, no. uh, here. Looking at the earnings, grabbing them. We're showing you how to use the Pro. There's so many cool tools in the Pro. Here, promo uh, for the Pro here for the next. Yeah, minute. gonna have to do a good old fashioned refresh. Jeez. Uh oh, uh oh. Okay, here we go. So when your Pro's not okay. acting up, you got to refresh. It. Amazon. Here we go. Let me make Where it. were we? 2012. How much money were we making back in like 2013? Uh, the so problem is quarterly I mean, here too, so you got to add all those up. Yeah, but like EPS was negative a lot of times yeah. for a lot of, for a lot of quarters, right? Yeah. What are they making now? <laughs> That's your growth. We make fifteen bucks a quarter. Fifteen dollars a share. People were saying Amazon was overvalued when it was three hundred dollars a share. Not a joke. Like three hundred dollars. They're like this valuation makes no sense. Like I'm reading multiple articles on it. They didn't first see this company eventually be able to make fifteen dollars a quarter. A quarter. Yeah. That's growth when you're growing earnings and you're reinvesting in the company. And you know what? I I don't remember who was on the show. Was it Michael Pactor? Did Michael? Does Michael cover uh, Amazon? Was it Michael? Uh, yeah, he does. Anyways, I can remember him saying like five years ago on the show. I love Michael Pactor, by the way, but I'm saying I remember him saying when the stock was trading like at a, like eight hundred or a thousand dollars. He's like, if they want to, Amazon can make twenty or thirty dollars a share right now, but they don't want to do that because yeah. one, they don't want to pay taxes, but two is they want to keep reinvesting in the company for growth. He's like, if they stopped doing that right now, they'd be making twenty or thirty dollars a share. And when the stock was back eight hundred dollars, like, oh, this is actually not that expensive of a stock. And you know what? He's absolutely right. And look at them now. Here they are making what fifty, sixty dollars a year. 
Yeah, most impressive, as Darth Vader would say. Most impressive. Someone, most impressive. someone in the chat was like, "Netflix should buy EA." Well, maybe they end up buying someone. Who's to say? Um, but I don't know, Netflix doesn't make too many big acquisitions. Anyway, no, they don't. Okay. So, okay. moving on. So, okay, so the the meme stocks, the dream stocks, and I'm sorry, what was the third extreme one? Extreme growth extreme stock. stock right? So yeah, going back to Kathy. Oh, she was on uh, CNBC yesterday. Did anybody catch that? Nice little interview with Kathy Wood there. Um, the one thing I find interesting with Kathy Wood is she sticks to her thesis. You gotta, you know, like like Kramer called her the best average downer in the history of average downers, which is so true because she'll just keep buying and buying and buying and buying and bringing that cost basis down. She'll buy a stock like Sean Udall was saying like 200, 300 times, you know, so obviously <clears throat> averaging down if the, as the prices come down. But one thing, you know, that sh all of her stocks follow is that she's a believer in deflation. Deflation because of technological innovation. And she was talking about that yesterday. And you're like, when you start hearing deflation in this environment, you start rolling your eyes and thinking, oh boy. But I mean, she makes good points. I mean, technological innovation is bringing down prices of things. It's making things more efficient. Um, the problem is what we're seeing in this current environment. I mean, what have you done for me lately is we're seeing inflation everywhere. So we're seeing the exact opposite, which is not good for Kathy. So if you are a big believer in that inflation is not transitory and is sticking that is not good news for Kathy Wood because one, she's in hyper growth stock. So those earnings that you're buying a stock, when you're buying a hyper growth stock, you're buying the future earnings. But if you have super, super high inflation, those future earnings are worth less. And that's why you're seeing, you know, the high growth names get hit on high inflation data. And that makes sense because those future dollars are worth a hell of a lot less if you're in a hyperinflationary environment, as opposed to like a Clorox or a Procter & Gamble that's making money right now. Those dollars are worth more today. So of, we know course, of course she's calling for deflation. They, she, you know, she has to. Her whole has investment to. thesis is built upon this. Right. So, she, I mean, if she thought, you know, we're going into an inflationary environment, she needs to sell all her stocks and move into something else. So she's, uh, she's not going to do that. So she's got to call for deflation. Is that reality? It's not right now. Is it reality in the future? We're going to go back to where prices aren't going up? Maybe. But it's hard to bring down prices once they start going up. I mean, take lumber, for instance. And this is a bad example for Kathy Wick. She has nothing to do with physical commodities. But if we take the lumber price and look at what it's done. Can you bring up the lumber futures? Is that possible in this? Uh... Yeah, I was just, uh, Oh, um, anyways. I can, I can bring it up, but, but not People anymore. know. We went from like $300 to like $1,700 on the timbers and, and lumber futures. And we're back to what, five or 600 bucks? We've come all the way basically full circle. Huge bubble, huge COVID bubble in the last month and the lumber has just been annihilated. And we've given most of it back. But if you look at your prices at your Home Depot and your Lowe's, lumber. there you go, perfect chart. Look at this, this is unbelievable. So it's given back the entire run for COVID basically, lumber futures all in the course of the last three months. This is basically, an, an, an enormous crash is what has happened here in the price of lumber. Um, you know, you're talking down 70% from the highs in three months. That is a crash. That is more than a crash. You know, the, the, we go back to like, you know, the, the crash of 29 and the crash of 87. These were down like 27%. This is 70%. This is more than a crash. This is just completely imploded. Now, but what is, what is your prices doing at Home Depot? They're yeah. not coming in. They're not coming in yet. And they will come down a little bit, but... You know, two by four is what? Two, three bucks. They're up to eight bucks. They're still eight dollars. They haven't come down at all. So it's hard to bring prices back down because once re once customers are paying a higher price, they get start to get used to it. And there's no reason to bring those prices back down. So if you were paying three bucks for the two by four and it goes to eight bucks, now it comes back to seven or six, you're feeling pretty good. Oh, it's paying eight. Now it's six. It feels cheap relative to where it was. So why would you ever bring it back down to three? You won't. And, you're, and somebody's just making more margin. I don't know if it's Home Depot. I don't know if it's the sawmills. I don't know if it's the person who's growing the trees, but I, I imagine it's not the person who's growing the trees. Uh, but you know, somebody's just making more margin. So I doubt we're gonna ever see those two by fours come back to three or four bucks. So that transitory inflation in lumber, which you would think, you know, as you could say, yeah, even Powell was saying this is a great example, but is it really? Because has my two by four, you know, the price to the consumer come down to where it was back before COVID started? It absolutely has not. So that seems more permanent to me, even though you're using lumber as an example of being transitory. I haven't seen my two by four prices come back down to three dollars, so I'll call BS on Powell saying and using that as an example of transitory inflation. Yeah, 
easier to raise prices, harder to lower prices. It's for, it's they right? just don't do it. They they come down a little bit. But you're uh, never you're never gonna see a three dollar two by four again. Or, or watch out for for shrinkflation, right? Well, that's continuous. I mean, product sizing is the yeah. hidden part of inflation. That's all together. You yeah. know, I've told different stories about that. You know, my my, uh, my son used to take baby for me because we adopted him. Uh, didn't breastfeed. He took baby for me, and I can remember. Um, you know, they uh they used to get seven hundred and twenty grams or whatever of the powder in this you know, container that you'd buy for like thirty bucks. Yeah. Okay. Well, it was twenty nine nine nine. They they advertise. New packaging, beautiful packaging, sleek packaging. But yeah. then you look, it's now 680 grams. So they knocked 40 grams out of it, but they kept the price at 29.95. But on your inflation data, that probably doesn't show up because it's still the same bottle. But no, they, they just changed the packaging and they're giving you less product. Yeah. I mean, you look at the peanut butter cups from when I was a kid and they, they, they were like this, you know, and now it's like they're little, you know, they're like the minis and the big cup is like what they used to be. They've shrunk the product sizing so much. So you have hidden inflation costs there as well. This isn't stuff that's captured in the CPI. This isn't part of the 5%. This is more on top of it all. So inflation really is still everywhere. When I hear deflation, it is hard not to roll your eyes, but I get it in technology companies. You know, my TVs have got cheaper. You know, certain things have come down in price. Technological innovation does keep prices lower to Kathy's point. But in a lot of industries, that is not the case. This is just an chart of the average gas price in the U.S., just... Um, you know, the place where the first place everyone feels inflation, right? Yeah. And, yeah. you know, I just fill up my truck. It's 150 bucks, 170 yeah. bucks. I fill up my boat. It's like $400 to fill up my boat. Yeah. So, and I don't even have, it's a 23 foot boat, 400, 400, over $400 filled up in Canada. All right. So, go, so going, back, going back to Kathy for a second, right? Because um, she, she may end up being right, right? The people that were pounding the table that the internet is a game changer, in you know the late 90s 2000 like they ended up they were right the internet changed everything but in terms of an investment public market standpoint it took about it took a decade to get over that to or to get back to those bubble levels in a lot of cases yeah. right it took the markets a while to get there so even even though people ended up being right internet was a game changer technology changed everything about how we live it took a while after the crash now I'm, we haven't had a crash to that extent yeah, I'm not saying we were going to, but my what I'm saying is it can take a while, right? For these, you know, let's get my ARKK chart back up. It can take a while for ARKK, or in my case, ARKW, which is what I own. Same, the charts look identical though. So there's, what's the difference? Um, yeah. the, it can take a while for them to to start to move again, like we saw. I mean, come on, like these moves that like we had in the back half of last year, they don't. They don't happen every day, every year. Every it's going to be some digestion of those yeah. moves. And some yeah. of these growth names need to catch up. You know, the earnings growth is happening in a lot of these companies. The top line growth is happening. But the stock prices have accelerated ahead of it. And to your point, I mean, this is what we saw in the extreme levels in 1999 and 2000, where people were paying, you know, extreme and extreme valuations for companies to buy growth. Everything all that mattered was growth. And I mean, obviously we had the tech bubble crash and then you had 10 years and we know we, we, we've we used, you know, different charts like Cisco, you know, that had never got back to those highs. So if you pay too high of a price for growth, it may never grow into it. And that's, you know, the issue with a Cisco investor, you know, where if we bring up that long-term chart, Cisco was $85 back in 1999, it's $54 today. So if you for the last 22 years, you're down 30% on your money. So buy and hold doesn't always work in all stocks. And, you know, to, to the point he's going to keep scrolling it back here and yeah. see that. But you can see that's the tech bubble burst. Yeah. We have some stocks that are like that. We do have some stocks, but it's not the entire market at all. There's a lot of stocks that still have value. Yeah. And I'm not trying to talk you all into value investing. I think no. you got to have a combo approach, um, you know, the barbell approach, growth and value. But when you're paying just crazy, crazy multiples for stocks like Tilray, when it got to $300, I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Yes, you have growth, but... You know, you're at a level where it may never ever see that again. I mean, Tilray was $300 at 15 bucks now. So obviously, post merger, you may not see that on the chart because it's merged with Afri now. It's kind of a different company, I guess. But um, you know, it never got back to those levels. So you just got to watch paying crazy valuations, and that's my warning to AMC investors as well. I don't see how you know the company is worth 20 billion dollars. I don't see how it was worth 30 billion dollars last week. I don't see how it's worth 20 billion dollars today. Reality is setting in to a certain extent here. Is it going straight back to $10? No, it's going to be, there's going to be ups and downs and nothing goes straight down, nothing goes straight up. But if you're, you know, buying this on the dream, 
buying this, you know, that, you know, we're going to squeeze the shorts. Just be careful because the people who are getting squeezed right now aren't the shorts. It's the longs. And I mean, you've got this case where, yeah, I, you know, I, 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 I like the, the idea of the movement. We have a movement to make markets better. We have a movement to get out, you know, any efficiencies. We have a movement to, you know, to bring in naked shorting if it's really out there. I mean, we have a move, we have different movements. I'm all for the movements, but when you're buying a stock that was worth a billion dollars last year and you're paying $30 billion for the stock, you're setting yourself up to probably, if you hold long enough, to eventually likely lose money. So, yeah. and I think that's what we're seeing now. So, I know I'm sorry to say, but I don't believe AMC is going back to $70. I don't believe it's going back to 60. It might. Maybe even, the movement even, gets hot again. Anything can happen in this market. We even know though that. You, even though you believe in the overall sentiment behind the movement, which is, you know, power to the people. Sure. Right, for right, sure. Right. Yeah. Screw, you know, uh, t- take, take it to the hedge funds. Even if you believe in that, that doesn't mean your stock, like AMC has to go higher. Right. Uh, I mean, I, I wouldn't want to be the last person. I, I wouldn't want to be the guy or girl in, you know, 2025. That's like, if we just hold on a little longer, they're going to have to cover Like I don't, that, that won't. And, and, and oh, who's oh, covering? Like we've looked at this short interest. This hasn't changed. I mean, they keep saying, Oh, it's the short interest. It's the short interest. It's not a high short interest stock. The borrow hasn't been difficult on the street. I've been able to easily borrow the stock for a long time. Um, it's just not true. Like, I mean, it, th- th- there's shorts. Sure, there's people who are short stock. One thing to consider, too, when you're always going after stocks with high short interest, the short interest is there for a reason. And usually it's those reasons is the companies are struggling or the companies just, you know, haven't figured it out or the companies just aren't very good companies. And there's a theme here that's happened in the last couple of weeks. All the stocks that were having the high short interest are coming back down and it's not a matter of a lot of times that the shorts are evil you know and this it's a matter of efficiency and people are betting on the short side because these companies are struggling and you know and and so you look at like a gamestop too and we were warning about gamestop here i warned on my twitter account two three days ago with amc starting to go down eventually you know gamestop is likely to start getting hit too i mean it is a balancing act you know yeah you want some growth yeah you want you know if you want to go in for the movement i get that but don't you know don't be surprised if it doesn't work out for you financially when you're moving into something if you want to stick with it for the movement you know that's up to you i've i i say you know i'm trading a lot of things technical when they start breaking down through key support levels you know you're going to get more technical sellers you're going to get people who aren't going to hold you're going to get people who aren't don't have diamond hands in there i mean when amc broke through 50 it was a technical breakdown and you know what if you were shorting it through 50 you've taken no heat at all the stock never got back up through 50. i, I guess it did that little blip through and then it came back up the next day after we made our bet but I mean, it's been straight down ever since. The stock's thirty-one dollars now, and you're looking at it and thinking, "Is twenty billion cheap?" It's not. Yeah. So you know, I, again, you know, I'm I'm not saying you know I'm all for the movement and stuff, but you've got to consider all those factors when you're investing in the stock market. You know, just picking a stock because everybody's in it and we're going to move the price up isn't always the best reason to be investing in a stock. I, I should mention we did have a bunch of data at 30 We had jobless claims, which came in exactly in line with the estimate. I don't think that's happened since COVID started. 360,000 jobless claims filed uh, last week, which was the estimate. Uh, New York Fed manufacturing index, huge beat. Philly Fed missed a little bit. Uh, import prices were up 1% month over month. Um, bunch of 830 data there. Uh, not sure if any of it moved the market. Probably not. But jobless claims are what they are. Still, still high. <laughs> Oil Lee is saying, can you say the same thing about Ethereum? Absolutely. I mean, you know, it's all about valuation. I'm big Bitcoin, crypto, all this stuff has been killed for a reason. And it's because no value investor is buying that type of thing. Yeah, I'm in some Ethereum. Do you know how much Ethereum is? It's 0.5% of my portfolio. So 0.5, not five. Yeah, it's probably 0.5 and probably less now. Yeah. I haven't looked at it because it's going down. It's probably 0.4 now. It was speculative. You want to have some speculation in your portfolio. I always have, you know, like five to 10% of speculation because some of those speculative things. But when I'm investing in Ethereum or Bitcoin, I said to Bitcoin when I was investing, I was like, I'm going to zero on this or I'm going to the moon. Right. <laughs> you know, it's it doubled and I, I, I took I'm the half. same way. I'm either going to zero or I'm going to the moon. On some stuff, you know, and if you're young enough, you can do more speculation. I'm kind of mid-age now, so I like the value stuff. You know, like like Apple, for instance. I believe Apple is 7% of my portfolio, just Apple. It's grown into that, but it's 7%. I mean, 
daily moves in Ethereum, Ethereum can drop 10% in a day and Apple can drop 1% a day, the Apple will impact my portfolio more than the Ethereum will. So yeah, you can have some speculation in your portfolio, but am I putting all my money in Bitcoin like Pomp? No, because you know what? I don't know how this ends. I don't know. I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm more of a value guy, but if you're a young kid, you're 20 years old and you just want to go all in on something, you can recover from that. You know, so I'm not going to say you can't do that. You know, it's not for me. I like to always stay diversified in my long-term portfolio and my trading portfolio. But, you know, if you're young enough, you can take more risks. And some of the crypto has worked out very well for a lot of people. You know, for Bitcoin, it's worked out very well. In, and, you know, and I'm in from uh, 16 or 17,000 on Bitcoin as well. So, you know, it has worked out for me still too. But, you know, as it's coming back in, I'm wondering if I'm going to eventually be red in this thing. But you can see all of these things are correlated together. You know, the meme stocks, the extreme growth stocks, the dream stocks, the crypto is the dream. So all that stuff has come back down to reality to a certain yeah. extent. And you don't have this, like we call on value stocks, like dividend protection, earnings protection, where certain value investors will just come in. There's a huge portion of the market like Warren Buffett that just invests in value when companies come cheap enough. Well, you're not going to get that with Bitcoin ever. You're not going to probably ever get Warren Buffett talked into buying Bitcoin because there's no cash flows to analyze. There's nothing like that. It's literally digits on a computer screen. The only way to extract value from it to a certain extent is just that you think somebody else is willing to pay more for it in the future. And that might be the case. And I do own some Bitcoin. And I do own some Ethereum. And Ethereum, I think, has more utility, though. And that's why, you know, I was trading in some of my Bitcoin for Ethereum before, because I feel like the Ethereum has more utility. But, you know, anything can happen in any stock. But when you're value investing, the odds of Apple falling 70, 80 percent in a matter of a month is very low. You know, maybe we go into an epic crash and the war, you know, an asteroid hits the Earth or we have a pandemic that really is serious, a lot more serious than COVID. But for the most part, you're safer in those kind of stocks. Or we have a solar flare that knocks everything offline. I'm just saying it can happen. Well, that wouldn't be good news. Um, so I, I pulled up a chart of the uh, Russell 1000 value ETF and the Russell 1000 growth ETF. So the value one is the candles, the growth one is the is is, is the purple. Um, and and uh, and and you can see just like, like they're equal this year, right? If you go back to the start of the year, um, obviously recently the IWF has been outperforming. Um, you know, that's the growth one. And yeah. so, so, so that's, that's the other Can thing. We do what? that longer term. You'll see that growth has definitely outperformed value. I mean, we've talked about this yeah. for a long time. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, but like to your Dennis's point, like, um, where do you go? Because on the one hand, the dream stocks, the hot, some of that is like high growth tech are out of favor. Yeah. But it's not like value is crushing it, right? It's not yeah. right. Value ain't crushing it. So what do you do, right? We talked about how the, the Russell 2000 is a true representation of what's really happening out there. The spy is being carried by a handful of, of large cap tech stocks. What do you do now? Where do you go? I mean, do you go into cash? Like I, I mean, you, got this question, you get this question every day. I mean, yeah. if you're concerned, you know, that the overall market is just inflated, you can always go to cash. Cash is always, an, cash is an asset as well. And the people say, well, I'm losing, you know, to inflation. And that's true too. So, you know, you have to consider that, you know, I never want to be in cash permanently, but if you're worried that, and you're trying to play market timer here, and you're worried that, you know, we're in for this impending doom correction here, which, you know, what's to say, I don't know. Nobody really knows anything. I know all you're doing is guessing to a certain extent. You're making probability bets. I mean, my long-term portfolio has a significant amount of cash. It's had it for a while. It's probably underperformed because of that. Um, but even my swing trade portfolio right now, I'm like, I was talking with my buddy Mike there um, last night and I'm like, I don't have any long swings on right now. I always have some long, like overnight trades on, but the only long swing I have on right now, I believe is silver SLV. And I was just had that on because I was going to stop myself out. I bought a 2410. I'd like, I can stop myself out at 2375 here. If I get hit overnight. Cause it's yeah. silver, <laughs> silver. That's like, I'm literally playing defense. <laughs> so I'm just concerned that this market, you know, it, it, like we've been looking for a while, you know, Tim, mm. Tim's been on the show here multiple times the last couple of weeks warning us that, you know, looking under the hood, you know, we've got a lot of issues and we've got a lot of other stocks coming down, but those issues have been there. So I didn't liquidate my spy. I didn't liquidate my Apple. I didn't liquidate my Google and sell any of that stuff, but I've liquidated a lot of those, you know, growth names. Like I sold my Teladoc. I had Teladoc for a little bit there playing that, but it started to break down. I sold it at one. 58 i think three or four days ago i sold my amd 
I sold my AMD because I, yeah, I did. I was, I, it was one. I bought it originally as a swing trade at seventy six right. or seventy five dollars. It ran to eighty five. I sold half, and then it ran to ninety five. I was like, maybe I should just stick this in the long term portfolio. And then it had that like fell like nine points in literally two days, and I was like, no, this doesn't belong in my long term portfolio. Too much volatility. So then it popped back up over ninety, and I was like, okay, I'm getting out. And it's ninety right now, so it's basically right where I just sold it. So I sold my AMD out. I, I, like I look at the long term portfolio, there's a few stocks in there, uh, but for the most part, I don't have a lot of long swings on right now. It's almost all cash. The other side of the coin is from Johnny Galt, right? Growth is on sale. Time to go shopping. That's the other side of the coin. Well, right? yeah, and maybe it is. <laughs> I don't like catching. So okay, let's use Upwork as an example. You know, maybe you want maybe you wanted the stock, and it's like wow, just fell eleven bucks. Uh -huh. I never like buying on day one. I want to let the dust settle. Give me a level. Give me something to lean on. Right now, all I have is yesterday's low. Well, we're through yesterday's low right now, so I don't have anything. Yeah. So I want a recent level. Me and Joel, Joel's taught me this. You know, Joel's going to be back next week, but it's the two consecutive lows in a row. That's what I look for. So where I get something from the previous day where it holds the previous day's low, and then I have something to lean on. That's how I strike on almost all my swing trades. If I'm, And usually I like to get stocks that are in uptrends. Stocks and uptrends. It's got overdone. It's pulled back. Now I get two days in a row. I get something to lean on. Maybe it's curling up a little bit. And those are the better plays from from you know the long perspective. But I mean, it's an art, you know. And you've got to do what works for you as well. If you've had a lot of luck doing different things or just buying on day one, but there's a lot of risk to buying on day one after a big down move. Yeah. All right. So well, we don't have a guest today, so we'll do some ticker time at some point uh, uh, before we end here. I I, I want to talk about Grub for a second. Uh, they had some numbers out. Um, um they uh this is this is just eat takeaway is, is yeah is, it's merged now right uh, the, the the merger the merger went through so the name of the company is, is not grubhub it's just, just eat, eat but uh but uh q2 order growth this is order growth was 47 percent uh which was down from a 79 percent figure the prior quarter um, orders in the UK, which is where Just Eat is from, uh, were up 61%. So UK is their fastest growing market. Order growth in Germany was still pretty strong as well. At least stronger than the average, it was 50%. Um, but they said that order growth overall, big decline quarter over quarter. I, I guess that's not a total surprise. Um, also, competition is increasing. Uh, there's a few a few new players in this space. So uh, Grub uh, down 5% this morning on that news. I haven't looked at the longer term chart for a while on Grub. Um, I don't that 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 candle was nothing, so you can ignore that. That's but, hard uh, with a lot. It's not a long term chart here, at least for me on my system. Is it on your system? Uh, no, because no. it's from the merger. Yeah, they merged. So we don't see it long, yeah. long term there. I mean, stocks making new lows. I always say you got to go. I believe this looks to me it like it's making a new all time low here today, or at least close to it. It is. So yeah, I don't buy stocks making new all time lows ever. Okay. So I could like number one golden rule: stock making new all time lows. Mm -mm, not for me. Uh, Morgan Stanley had earnings this morning. We should probably talk about that for a sure. second. EPS beat a buck eighty-five versus a buck sixty-five. Sales beat fourteen point eight versus thirteen point nine six billion dollars. So, a beat and a beat. Uh, institutional security revenues. Uh, um, uh, seven, about seven billion down uh, from eight billion a year ago. Investment banking revenue up sixteen percent. No surprise there. Deal flow is off the charts, right? With all these backs, um, and equity net revenues up eight percent year over year. So uh, Morgan down one percent in the period. Just such a disappointing. It's every single quarter. It's like Groundhog Day around here. The banks beat and they don't go up. And mm -hmm. we did it again. They did it again. Citigroup. Everybody was loving the move two days ago. They're like, oh, it was actually up on its earnings. Yeah. What did they do yesterday? They pull the rug out from under it. They pull the rug out from under it on day two. Goldman Sachs just had the, one of the best reports you can have. They didn't rally the stock. It's down 10 points from where they were. Morgan Stanley, it's a nice beat. It's actually been a stock that has been just an unbelievable performer compared to some of the other banks. I mean, you look at the other bank charts long term, and we've done that exercise. Morgan Stanley is just kicking up here at all-time highs and you know, kicking ass and taking names. Um, so that that's good. But you, know, you get a pullback here. It just hasn't been the type of market it seems like forever where they reward banks for good earnings. And maybe it's because they don't have the growth. Maybe they just, you know, cheap stocks just stay cheap. A lot of the, some of the banks have performed though. There has definitely been separation to my point. Like Citigroup has been an underperformer. It seems like forever. JP Morgan has been a decent performer, even though not in the last month. So 
I don't know. Would I buy bull pullbacks on the banks if they get cheap enough? Maybe, but I've never this, been a big fan of the banks. Why this is the only sector I'm looking at today? I mean, at least the only one that looks like it's setting up to go up. <laughs> the banks. Why? Why do you say that? Because, because I mean, I don't see the, anything here. that looks like you might be right, but I don't see what you're seeing. Look I at mean, WFC. Bank of America. Look at Bank WFC. America's making new lows on the okay. move. Okay. Citigroup's making trying to make new lows on the move. Well, what do you see? So one of the things that you're seeing is it kind of a pullback. And a lot of times when I get these these early earnings weeks, a lot of the times, I mean, the banks are the ones that first go, right? And then Always, we get, yeah. And we get these questions of, I think it's common, we get these questions about tech. And then the next thing you know, it's inflation. Next thing you know, it's value. The banks give a little run and then they, they, they kind of die down. Um, right now, if let me pull up this chart so I can show you guys. Sure. Um, so one of the things that I try to do is always, you know, sector and industry analysis. So right here, this is banks global. And I see that this is like a, an index that they try to do with uh, all the banks that are in there. And I see this kind of multiple lows that I could just lean on. I saw this uh, low right here from Friday, 340, 348.90. So I'm expecting to get a little push, a little push in the banks today. That It, it couldn't be like a long-term trade, but I'm always looking for at least somewhere where they could go green. To me, I'm going to be looking at the banks. The one thing to consider is the banks are a good inflation trade, I think, in my opinion. So because you, what we were talking about is tech being future earnings, banks are earnings now. Banks are making money now. So those now dollars are more important than the future dollars in an inflationary environment. So we have seen, obviously, you do see when the TLT and interest rates, if interest rates have to start climbing up, we know because to fight off inflation, the banks are going to benefit from that. So if you believe in the interest going up, if you believe in rates going up and you believe in the inflation trade, Mitch would be correct with owning the banks here. So you are getting a pullback. So maybe it is time. You know, you could totally talk me into this, maybe adding a little bit of banks to my portfolio here. I mean, Bank of America is 38 bucks. It was 43. So it's basically 15% off right now. We're giving back a lot of this, you know, run that we had before. Um, it's interesting, Mitch. I mean, I could, I could, if you think the TLT rally isn't going to last, the 20-year we're talking about, if you think that rally is not going to last, that's going to start to roll over again here. There's an argument to be made to own the banks. Look at this chart, TD. Mol three lows right by the same area TD. and a gap up right above it. Yeah. Hey, who knows? Maybe it fills the gap. I, I, I've been looking at those plays more often, the gap fills, and, and they, they've been doing pretty well. Yeah, it, and you know what? You're, 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 you're looking at the approach, right, too, because you're giving yourself an out. You see these lows in the same area, like, okay, it takes those out, didn't work, I'll move on. But, you know, you, you're looking at it from a perspective of where am I getting out if I'm wrong? And you can put any trade on as long as you have an out. So I don't mind the setups here. And, you know, there's a thesis there, too. So I get it, Mitch. Yep. The, the, the top one for me, when I, what I usually do is I work backwards. I've been running through the names. WFC uh, and TD stand out to me, at least their charts. <laughs> Uh, let's look at Taiwan Semi real fast because they had earnings. And yep. I know someone in chat asked about that a while ago. So I, I don't want to leave them hanging. Uh, they, they had good earnings uh, and they raised their guidance. Their guidance was strong. Q3 sales guidance in the range of 14.6 versus $14.9 billion versus an estimate of 14.4. Um, and they are exploring a, uh, a, a, a plant building plan in Japan, according to Bloomberg. Um, so strong guidance. Earnings were in line. Beat. The pullback here on a stock that was starting to trend up, I often like. Let's see, it's a very important day for it. it needs to hold this 120. That's where you had congestion before we started breaking out three days ago. So we come back to the point of congestion. Let's see if that level can hold. So I would say 120 to 121 is a critical support level. That's where we're trading right now. It's critical that that holds. If it starts to take out 120, I wouldn't want any part of it. If I was really putting on a trade, maybe even look to the July 12th low of 119.52 and say, okay, if that holds, I'm going to try it here at 121 and risk myself a buck and a half, or I guess it's two bucks here at this point in time. And you know, if it takes that out, I'm going to get out. But I usually, after an earnings report, I like to have that little digestion period where, okay, let's see, because sometimes you'll get the, you know, the open and you'll see, you know, some significant movement afterwards. So I like to usually lay off on day one after a big earnings report. Okay. Um, that For was a great that question going back to AMD. I'm just saying it feels oh. like it's an educational day. Yeah. So Millie was asking, he's like, why, or I don't know if Millie's a he or she, sorry. Uh, but they were asking um, why 
then you write calls against your AMD instead of selling the stock outright. And you know what? There's a there's an argument. If you think we're just in a, for a little correction, if you just think we're just pulling back here and you're in a stock and you just want to get some extra income, there's always that argument or you hold your stock and you just write some calls and bring your cost basis down. But in the case of AMD, it's a pretty wild stock. And the one thing to consider is when you're writing calls, you give up your upside, but you don't protect your downside any more than the premium you're bringing in. And call writing works, you know, works well in a market that's just oscillating, going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. It works well in a market that, you know, is just slowly drifting down. It works well in a market slowly drifting up. It doesn't work well in parabolic markets and it doesn't work well in crashes. So it all depends on what your risk tolerance is and what your exposure is. I mean, I entered AMD not as a long-term investment. I entered it as a trade and I should stick to it as a trade. I mean, if you want, you've got some portfolio stocks and you want to just enhance the yield. My buddy Chris Bandy does this all the time, buys dividend like stocks that yield 5 6% and then writes calls against them, upside calls against them, and enhances the yield to like 8 9 10% on some of these 5 6% payers. That's a full strategy in itself that works very well. I don't feel like AMD is the kind of stock. Um, you know, you'll get a little bit more premium there, but it's a little bit more wild too. I mean, let's just go look at the options chain and see what I could have done. I mean, the stock is at 89 at close, so that would have been where the options were valued. It's obviously up at 90 here this morning. But if you went out and say, okay, I'm a little bit nervous, I'm going to go out a month and write the calls instead, um, you could have got going out to August, just a, a fun little exercise. Going out to August, we could have got three bucks for the 90s. So th three and a quarter, really. It was three and a quarter bit. So you could have got three bucks. So, you know, if, 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 if AMD is above 85 or 86, I'd be happy that I did that, just writing those calls. If AMD collapses down to 80, well, you, you brought in three, but just lost 10. So it all depends on why you're in the trade, why, you know, what is it, and, you know, your risk tolerance to a certain extent. I've, I've, I've been on both sides. I used to write a lot of covered calls. The reason I don't do it as much as I used to is I wrote, a, I bought a lot of great stocks back in the financial crisis, 2008, 2009. I wrote upside calls and then we had a really big move and I got called away on like everything. And people say, well, then the trades worked. But I mean, did they really? I mean, you know, I, I can remember, you know, buying eBay at 11 bucks and this was pre, prior to PayPal, writing like the 15 calls, I got called away at 15. And the thing was like 25 when I, you know, when, when, you know, I, I actually got called away. And then I'm like, okay, well, I just gave up, you know, I brought in a buck for the 15, but I gave up 10 on the potential, you know, and obviously back during the financial crisis, we didn't even know where stocks were going. There was, it was, it was crazy back then. So I don't know. I've been turned off to a certain extent in my long-term portfolio about writing covered calls because you give up so much return and you're still taking on risk. That's, that's the downside to writing covered calls. The upside is you're bringing in premium works great in a sideways market. Um, Dennis, yesterday we told, we, we, we had been asked for a couple of days about Oatly. We talked about it yesterday, and then a few minutes after you left, a short report comes out from from Spruce Point. Okay. So uh, the timing was interesting there. But Oatly, uh, which we, you did say twenty was critical, and uh, it it is it is holding. It's trying to it hold still, holding. even with a short report. That's good news. If I had yeah. a short report and it didn't take out that support, that's very good news. Yeah, you can say, oh, we took out twenty, but nineteen sixty two, you still closed above twenty. Yeah. So I'm going to say that nineteen sixty two, like low, that's the one. It's, so it's still critical that that holds that. Again, I believe I called this the beyond meat of the milk it, market. You did. So you can tell I'm not a huge fan. I'm not a huge fan of beyond meat. I'm not a huge fan, but I haven't done enough homework to say. I, I'm just saying technically 20 is critical. It tried to take it out yesterday. It's good that it closed above. And if I had a short report coming out, it still couldn't take it out. That's good news. If I was long this thing, I would definitely lean on the 1962 low. Meaning if it cut out and started trading 1950, I'd sell it. I bring that up because I think Spruce Point is on is on CNBC. Oh, uh, they're on right now. Or, or they're on right now? Okay. Well, I think so. Yeah, I see OTLY up there. Is that the gentleman from Spruce Point? Must uh, yeah, yeah. In this. Oh, very nice. Um, but our TVs are broken in the office, so <laughs> that can't actually, I don't actually know. I'm just... Uh, I can on, see him on the TV. So. Based on what's happening. My TV is not broken. Um, okay. Uh, any other... I know there's a bunch of questions we didn't get to in, in chat. Uh, someone asked about Intel into earnings next week. Everybody has earnings next week. Netflix is earnings next week. Let's look at next week ahead. We, we, we have uh, On Tuesday, we have Netflix and Chipotle. This is just a few. Uh, we've got Snapchat and Twitter on Thursday. We've got IBM on Monday. Wow, big, um, big, big Yeah, big we've got things. Intel. The week after is all the rest of the big ones, Apple, Amazon, Facebook. Mm. Um, so we're heading into the heart of earnings season, which really starts – I mean, this week we had the banks, but the real earnings parade starts next Tuesday. 
Um, and it's going to be that for, for basically three weeks after that. So uh, into earnings, how does Intel look to you? I, I own it. Yeah. Um, I put in the long-term portfolio almost at the bottom at 54 and change. Um, it's been up to 50. I just, I just re-put it in there in May. It's went up to 58, back to 54 kind of. It's kind of just range bound. So, you know, 58, it's been the range 54 to 58. It's in the middle of the range right now. So it's kind of in the middle of nowhere. It hasn't performed well. It's been an underperformer. It is a value stock though. It is my kind of stock. I mean, I'm a value guy. If you look at my stocks portfolio and, and if you look at my stock portfolio, like in my long-term investment portfolio, in less than 10 seconds, you would say, oh, you're a value investor because I've got all the value stuff in there and including preferred stocks. So I like getting paid. I like the little dividend. I, I've, I've played Intel a few times successfully. I loved it at the 45 level. I played it a couple times there. Um, I maybe, you know, I didn't re-get it at 45. I didn't think it was going to go back down there. So I, I don't know. I, I have no opinion on it here, even though I have it in my long-term portfolio. I'm just kind of in it. What do we think of Delta today? After the it got well, upgraded, yeah, some digestion. Oh, did it get upgraded? Yeah, um, Ray, RJ put a strong buy on it, upgraded to strong buy. Ooh, and on spot. another day, because airlines are down today, IWM is getting hit today. Delta would be down, but because the upgraded is trading in the green, you're leaning on yesterday's low 40 bucks. I mean, that's the important level $40.12. I mean, it's not great news that the stock was trading up pre market on the report yesterday and gave it all back and started going making new lows. That's never good news. It is good news that RJ upgraded it. They are influential. They do um, have some uh, some weight. I think you got to hold yesterday's low, 40.12. 40 psychological level, probably some optionality there. So it's critical that that level holds. Uh, somebody asked, who asked? Uh, Lord James asked, will the Olympics affect stocks? Uh, so the Olympics start in, oh, eight days. That's crazy. Um, well, we have, so there's not going to be any fans in attendance, right? We know that. That's and, and we know from last year that lower uh, that no fans correlated with lower viewership. We don't know, if, you know, correlation doesn't equal causation, obviously. So we don't know if one led to the other, but we do have some history of, of no fans in the stands equ equating to low viewership on TV. Mm -hmm. The only thing I could think that only stock I would think that would affect is Comcast, right? Cause they own NBC. They've got the broadcast rights. Now they've already sold out their ad inventory. So it's not a question of that, but lower viewership is, is, is probably a headline you're going to see in the next month. Uh, Olympic viewership down X percent uh, from four years ago, five years ago, or whatever, right? Um, that's a headline that, that I'm expecting to see. So if you're thinking about it in terms of headlines, then I would look at Comcast. But that's the only one I, I, I would think of um, as far as the Olympics. But have that on your radar. Probably going to get lower viewership. Um, I would expect, at least based on what, what happened last year with every every sport having a lower viewership and and no fans being in attendance. I think um, it affected the overall market when they told the, when when Japan said there wasn't going to be fans in the stand. You really saw the reopening trade really start to come off. Then. Interesting. And, and there's an and there's an argument to be made that that was one of the catalysts that really started to hit. Where was that? Like trade. it was a week ago, I think, or two weeks. Yeah, ago? and you haven't really seen the reopening stocks. I think that was like a, another catalyst. I mean, we know we've been worried about the Delta variant, but you know, obviously some of these countries are really struggling with COVID right now. I don't know if Japan is as bad. Like India is really struggling apparently with them and some of these other countries developing countries are just struggling because they don't have vaccinations um they don't have the vaccines i mean canada's come around and, you know we're going we're i think friday getting into stage three of reopening which is almost fully open the reason i believe um the stats coming from canada 81 percent, 81 have now been vaccinated in canada so four out of five people obviously okay. never going to get 100 percent because people don't want to get vaccinated certain people um but I mean, we, you know, it's definitely a positive correlation between vaccines and COVID cases, you know, going down. So some countries are really struggling because they don't have the vaccines. We were struggling for a while because we didn't couldn't get the vaccines. We have them everywhere now in Canada. It's, you know, lots of Moderna. Pfizer was a little bit in the short, but, you know, it's coming around now too. So, I mean, the vaccines help. And, you know, obviously in the States, we saw that because you had vaccines sooner that it was helping with that. The question is, you know, is the vaccines going to, you know, are we able to get them in these other countries? You know, are people going to take them? And, you know, or, or is the Delta variant going to, you know, be effective? Is it going to be, it sounds like it's effective against it, but that's all to do with the reopening trade. So right back to your Olympics question is no fans in the stands, I think turn people off of the reopening trade. I really do. You know, I, I don't know how big of an indicator this is, but, you know, I haven't been on, remember last year, we were all looking at that COVID dashboard every day, the new cases. I haven't been on that dashboard all year. I haven't been. No, on, I don't go on it anymore. Either. Yeah, yeah, I don't yeah. look at it all either. I've been on it all year. 
Maybe. I feel like we're getting like I hope I hope to say that we're gonna get past this. Like I obviously I mean, we don't I'm, all want to be stuck in this, wait. you know. I, I, I we're getting past it. Come on, I mean we're, we're already moving past it. Well, <laughs> yeah, it's not it's not every headline. It's not, but I mean you, you hope like every the rest of the world is gonna get. It seems like in North America we're starting to actually get past this to a certain extent. I mean it's always it's never gonna go away. We're never gonna get there's no COVID anymore, and it's just you know it's like you know the measles and it's just gone and nobody gets it anymore i mean it's never gonna be like that it's gonna keep you know changing there's always gonna be you know a worry oh my friend got covid you know it's starting you're always gonna have that to a certain extent so are we ever getting back to full normal i'm not 100 percent sure on that but i mean at least we're getting back to somewhat resembling normal you know being able to go out and do some stuff i mean my wife ate dinner on a patio that was the first time uh, last week oh really that was the first time i'd been out for dinner in a restaurant it was even wow. though it was on a patio because you're not allowed to eat in the restaurants in ontario yet but on the patio in a year and a half and you know what it was like wow this is like weird it's weird because <laughs> we've done takeout but i mean sitting in a restaurant is like you know it's like a good feeling you know yeah. and i hope you know we're going to get back to that i hope my kids gonna be able to go into school in september i hope he's gonna be able to play hockey in september i hope all these things are going to happen i think they are um and, and if you do believe that we're getting the full reopening the reopening stocks are definitely on sale so, you know, when resorts, interesting, you know, Kramer's been really pumping that one, saying he buys it every day in his long-term portfolio or for his, uh, for his uh, actions alert. Yeah. I mean, you got yesterday, we are right there at 110. It's a critical level, but the staying stocks just keep going down every day. So I'm like, I want to buy these reopening stocks. They just haven't given me a signal yet. They haven't given me like the, it's all clear signal. They keep going down. I do have some Las Vegas sands, like I said. And that hasn't made a new law on the move. I have a small piece of pen still left, which has been absolutely terrible. Um, but, you know, if we get the reopening, you know, these stocks will start to come around. So maybe it's you start nibbling on some of these. When they're making new lows, though, like a pen, it's like it's it hasn't really given me a signal to like, ah, let's go rah, rah and buy a bunch of reopening stocks. It'll happen. We'll get that nice candle, nice bar, and then we'll get a pullback and then we'll lean on those yesterday's low. That's how I'm going to play it. But right now, I have very few long swings on because I'm just nervous about this market. Theme of the day is that reopening stocks are on sale and tech stocks are on sale. Hey, everything is on sale. All right. A little bit. But what's a sale? You know, stock's up 100%. Uh -huh. Now it's like, okay, it's 10% off. Uh, AMC's really on a sale? sale. AMC's on sale. It is compared to where it was. It, $30. <laughs> we, we said 40 was critical. That took that out and boom, right down to 30. So 30 is your next. That 28.53 if you're an AMC trader, June 1st low. Um, I think you should bounce there. Hopefully you should bounce there. It is getting oversold. Um, again, fundamental value here, though, is a lot lower. So, you know, anything can happen. Um, I still think rallies to be sold in AMC, but it's oversold here and probably due for a bounce if you're a trader. But I'm not calling the bottom on AMC. Not, more, not at all. The more AMC falls, maybe the greater chance we see speculation that somebody will buy them because no one's buying them at 60 or 50 or 40. Nobody's buying. Oh, I, I see this in my chat. Maybe it's nobody 20. was buying them at a billion dollar market okay, cap okay, last fine, year. Right. So All nobody's right. buying them at a $20 billion market cap. That is dream. That's dream. So we talked about the mean, okay. the extreme, I'm, and the dream. The dream is oh, yeah, somebody's going to pay $30 billion for AMC. All right, I can right. almost nothing is guaranteed in this world, but I can almost you know ninety nine point nine 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 percent. I was joking. That was, AMC is, but there, there's people that believe that okay. that somebody at Netflix is going to come and buy AMC. Netflix has basically you know <laughs> done gonna... major damage to AMC. Why would they do that? It doesn't Net make any Netflix, sense. Have, they've already killed AMC. I don't think they're going to come and they they that they would make out. no sense. There's there's no you know. There's, there's, there's no white horse coming in here and scooping up AMC at $100 a share. The only way AMC goes back to $100 a share is if the story gets hot and, you know, the meme trade gets hot again and, you know, and, and fundamentals completely and continue to be ignored. That would be the only way I could see AMC ever getting back up to even 60 or 70. So I think the likely scenario in the long term is AMC is still a lot lower from $31, but I think it's due for a bounce. So I think... But I think when you look at a year from now, it would not surprise me in the least if AMC was ten dollars again. Sorry right. to say it, guys. Smash the like for Dennis, and we will see him tomorrow morning. Have a good rest of your day, sir. 
and and I will, I promise, I will sort out this. The donuts. This we donut need the donuts. Out. I have an email out to Tim Hortons. Oh, oh, they responded to me. I have my donut eating. I got the Joey Jaws going. Wait, the wait, donuts. wait. They said, thank you for contacting us. May I have the correct email address, please? I will now send them your correct email, which I'm going to have to look up because apparently I don't, I can't get it right the first time. And, uh, and I will send, I, I will have them send you the actual gift card. Excellent. That I sent. I'm going to buy the dozen donuts. And I'll eat them live on pre-market. Prep. I sent so them, I them live. My, my, I don't. If I had a dozen donuts, I'd probably fall over and die. So I better not. I mean, you it's just what, what you were thinking too when you were saying I need the dozen donuts. It's like death. It would be really fun for a few minutes, but then I'm going to die after. So you know, it's a balancing act. There. I think after so, all this, I think you. How many donuts can you eat safely I without you know, getting sick to your stomach and falling over? And you, you owe it to us to at least eat one of them on the show. Did you? during the course of the show. So definitely do that. Maybe. All right. Okay. Thanks a lot, Triple D. All right. Okay. Uh, a few things we didn't get to. I want to talk about Casper, right? I saw a headline this morning on Casper. They announced a partnership with Bed Bath & Beyond. So it was moving. This one's been a dog. It was up in the pre market. Is it still up? Uh, Sort of. A little bit. Off its highs. Okay. So what was the news again? It was... um. CSPR, hop into my news feed, blah, 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 blah. Bed Bath Beyond announces Casper sleep offerings will be available through Bed Bath Beyond website and stores. Cool. So interesting. Casper's whole shtick was always direct to consumer, right? Direct to consumer online will make uh, buying a mattress as easy as, as it's ever been. Screw the middleman, screw the stores, direct to you. And now they're going into stores. Is that a good is is this long term good for Casper? Isn't this them? Isn't this a tacit admission that the direct to consumer model isn't quite working? I mean, that's what I'm. Re that's how I read this. Maverick is asking, "Where is Joel? Joel is somewhere in northern Michigan, it's in the woods, probably." Um, no, but in all seriousness, isn't this a, a admission by Casper that the direct to consumer model is not quite working? Why else would they want to go into a into retail stores? No, I mean I think so. This one's been a dog since the IPO, right? Look at the first day. Look, look at the open. The all-time high came on day one of fifteen eighty-five. Not great. Um, I I don't know, Mick, if they're if they're giving them to the retail stores for cheaper. I I, I don't know what, but this is this just flies in the face of the whole point of the company in the first place was which was let's offer you quality mattresses but you don't have to go through the store you can buy it directly from us we'll market it to you um also there's like a thousand uh not a thousand but there are a lot of online uh mattress companies now like the, the direct to consumer model is like once one person does it i mean like look at razors right like you got dollar shave club you got harry's once one person does it there are all these fast followers that just copy them I don't even know who was first. I don't know. I, no interest in, in Casper for me. But while we're here, I know Neil was looking at um, sleep number yesterday. I don't know what his takeaway was, but that chart looks a little bit better. Interesting. Okay, so there was that. Let's hop over to my movers tool. See, what, God, every day, guys, the stocks at the top of my uh, movers tool are, are ones I don't really know. So today it's, it's Bridgeline, which I do know. Uh, Bridgeline Digital, they announced... Uh, some uh what what is this headline um they announced a global management company in the industrial sector has chosen hawk search okay so that's not really a big thing but regardless the stock is moving big time this morning you've got it this is your trending stock in the morning on the upside blin right so pre-market high we hit it just a few minutes ago actually let's go to a one minute chart we hit the pre-market high of uh, 7.98. What time was that? At, that was 15 minutes ago. So BLIN is was what I'm watching this morning. I'm also watching. Uh, I saw Galapagos was your well, was the big loser, but now IMUX has taken over in Munich. Uh, they proposed an offering. Of course they did. That's what these companies do. Okay. Um, what else? Vera Bradley's up. Why is Vera Bradley up seven percent today? Uh, they highlighted the debut of their Disney collection. Oh, Disney. These Disney, Disney, you know, it's like we used to say, never underestimate the Oprah effect. Never underestimate the Disney effect, right? Same thing. 
Um, I saw a note from Mizuho on Square. They speculated or they threw out the idea that buying Square now would be like buying JP Morgan in like 1870 was what Mizuho said about Square. So whoever's been in our chat for the last week asking about Square and Roku, Mizuho likes it. Speaking of ratings, uh, I'm not seeing a ton today in analyst land. I think I think uh, there may be a few others that aren't here, but not seeing a lot in the ratings calendar this morning. What else is on y'all's radar? Uh, yeah, Glenn, I unfortunately, I do agree with you. Unfortunately, I do agree. Um, and Corey, yeah, I've always been that way, right? Going back to the Casper thing, I've I've never understood the wanting to buy a mattress online. But other, just because I don't get it, doesn't mean you know, not a thing. Lots of people do it. Apparently, it's not for me though. Um, ba ba ba. What? I'm just catching up in chat here. There's a few things I didn't get. Um, Apple stores did the same, Scott. Okay. I'm just catching up on chat. I know there's a few tickers that, uh, yeah, Mitch, you're exactly right. The direct to consumer, right? But yeah, let's overlay Casper with SDC. It's a tough, it's a tough game. Oh, look at those charts. Look at those charts. It is a tough game, direct to consumer. It is not easy because it's basically a marketing. It's a game of marketing, right? That's all it is. You're, you're marketing your convenience. It's not even a question of superior product. Oftentimes, the product is just as good as, as the other products out there. Man, great call out, Mitch. SDC and Casper. Different industries, same business model. Wall Street. So, all right. So, now we know Wall Street does not like direct-to-consumer, right? Um. Okay, Snap, Crackle, Pop. It, it's been like 24 hours since I've looked at space, which is a long time. Space was the stock that I, I did pick this one. Oh, man, am I not going to win? We did a another chat challenge last week, um, and we were looking at uh, we a few of us picked uh, what we thought would be the best performing stocks on a percentage basis from last Thursday till the end of this week. Um, space was my pick, and I was right for about five minutes. And I'm going to end up coming dead last, I think. Space is continuing to decline here. I don't have any moving averages on this chart, uh, Snap, Crackle. Um, I could add a few. But the problem is when I add stuff, people always complain, oh, add this or take that away. So I just keep it keep it, keep it, it even and have nothing on there most of the time. Um, this, but this was my pick in the chat challenge. I'm not going to win. I almost won last week, but I'm not going to win this week. So, uh, yeah, Space, ouch. Another, another move lower yesterday. So, wait, what do the moving averages say? Uh, about to hit the 200 day. Um, here, well, let's just add here. You know, let's just take a look. Okay. This, this might take a second, uh, cause I'm going to have to add a few different ones. Um, so let's look at a 50 day and let's look at a 200 day. Okay. Um. Wait, which color is which? The 50 day is the dark one. Okay, the 200 day is the light one. Oh man, it is about to hit. It it, it already it already crossed through. Uh, let's go to a 15 minute chart. No, let's go to a daily. It already it already crossed through the uh the 50 day. Yeah, we are heading straight towards that 200 day. So what? So what's that? What's that level there? 31 something. Yeah. 30 something. 30 20. Okay, there, there, there's a level to lean on. As far as just support, I don't even see any support. We broke through all that support. God, this chart looks ugly. Ugh. Oops. Yeah, JD Jordan. JD Jordan, I am never going to learn. I'm never going to learn. More often than not, news events are selling news events, right? I, 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 was, I was pounding the table. I was still on cannabis. I'm never going to learn. Right, it was a classic sell the news across the board. Right, MJ, MSOS, Canopy Growth, right, Kronos, Tilray, across the board, sell the news, sell the news, sell the news. You could you could point fingers and say, oh, it was because they admitted they don't have the votes. I, I call I call BS on that. Uh, we all knew they didn't have the votes yet. That's the whole point of introducing a bill and and, and then whipping up votes. Um, it's just a sell the news event. 
That's all it was. I think they were going to sell the news regardless of what was said in that press conference. So, yeah, I got that one wrong. I'm still long, though. So, um, but yeah, J- J- JD, I'm never going to learn. I'm never going to learn. <laughs> um, real quick, uh, public service announcement or programming note. We've got options explained with Robert Roy starting in about 10 to 15 minutes right here on this stream. That'll be followed by SPAX attack at 11 o'clock. The power hour at noon. Get technical at one. The BZ crypto show at two. Chance trades, which normally airs Thursdays at six, is going to be at two thirty today. We have uh, trivia. We're doing trivia twice a day now. Um, at three o'clock, trivia is Thursdays and Fridays. We got the at the close show at three thirty. Cannabis hour at four o'clock, and after hours with Ryan was beyond at five. Um, speaking of trivia, if you've never played trivia, it, it is probably our most Fun. I mean, it's our most interactive show, right? You, you can basically just, it, it's interactive game. You play with us. If you haven't played before, you should check out Zinger Stock Trivia. For those new people who don't know what Zinger Stock Trivia is, if you have not played before, this is how it works. We're going to have about 12 to 15 questions here. Each one's going to have four multiple choice answers. You type the number that corresponds with the answer you want to select, and the people who answer the most questions correctly and do so the fastest, of course, will win. And what do you win? Some sweet swag. All right. Thursdays and Fridays at 3 p.m. Eastern time. The theme for today's trivia, normally it's like markets and business. The theme for today is movies. If you like movies, tune into the Zinger Stock Trivia today, 3 o'clock Eastern time right here on this channel. Okay, um, let me let me see what else I missed as far as housekeeping items. I don't think I missed anything. Um, no, I, think I covered everything I wanted to cover. So I've got my movers tool open. There is just nothing of 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 interest here. Nothing of interest at the top of uh, what's up or what's down, right? Because there's nothing fundamental, which is annoys the crap out of me like there's nothing fundamental i like when there's fundamental moves like i like like headlines i like news good news bad news i don't care i just like news no news here joel picked the right week to go out of town i'll tell you that joel will be back on monday actually no i lied joel will be back tomorrow i expect i expect joel back tomorrow he said he said probably tomorrow so I expect Joel back tomorrow. Um, yeah. Okay. So that'll be it for me here. How many likes are we at? I haven't been uh, looking or or uh, pleading or begging for likes. We might have to start taking this show off. Three forty three. Off live, off live bro. We're, we're giving way too much for us to only get three hundred and forty three uh, likes. This I, should be up to five hundred. Do we got a charge? My 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 goal my goal every day was fifty percent of live viewers, which would put us at five hundred likes right now. So um, let's get, let's get to. I, I mean, come on, guys. We we put on be like eight hundred. Let's go. Free, come free on, show you, you get some education, maybe some entertainment, maybe a little bit of neither. You just like hanging out with us. That's cool too. Um, but yeah, drop us a like if you could. We'd appreciate that. And um, I have nothing really else, uh, nothing else for me here today uh, for you. So <laughs> Robert Roy is going to start in about five to ten minutes. If you haven't ever watched Robert Roy, you should. Uh, if you have questions about options, he explains options really, really simply. Right? He's really good at explaining options in plain English. The problem, my problem with options has always been, you can make it super complicated. Like it is a pool with, with a never running depth right you can get extremely complicated you can like with multi legs and it, it, he explains it really simply if you if you want like a basic understanding of options and and setups he's watching today trades he's putting on today or has put on this week why he did that he talks through his trades at length um does it for an hour every thursday 9 30 to 10 30 that'll be the, the next show on this channel uh yes christian robert is really good i completely agree and um yeah so all that being said this has been zinger pro on the screen you want it for free for two weeks 
Go to pro.benzinga.com, get a free two-week trial. You want a discount on Benzinga Pro. Enter the code at the bottom, YouTube20, Y-O-U-T-U-B-E-2-0. That'll get you 20% off any Benzinga Pro subscription. If you have your own following somewhere, you want to become a Benzinga affiliate, you can do that too. Earn 30% on every new subscription you send to Benzinga. The link is on the screen, Benzinga dot partnerstack.com that's how you become a benzinga of pro affiliate and uh any questions about benzinga pro you want some more help or whatever you can always email onboarding at benzinga.com uh any feedback for us anything as far as uh shows content things you want to see things you don't want to see um you want to inquire about hosting a show just email us shows at benzinga dot com goes to like a dozen people here myself included um so yeah any feedback we always welcome it good better otherwise shows at benzinga.com uh okay i'm gonna hop off here it is 9 20 run robert roy is gonna start in i think five minutes he's supposed to start at 9 25 um so four minutes from now uh good luck to everyone at the open ah thanks james james adams your number one man your number one Thank you. Um, what was I about? What was I just saying? I don't even remember what I was saying. Uh, <laughs> please remember all the information from our show is meant to be used as informational purposes, not for investing or training advice. Opinions expressed do not represent those of Benzinga. Um, get that off the screen there. Okay. That's it for me, everyone. Good luck. Who's my guest at, at the close today? Surprise. It's a surprise. AKA I haven't gotten one yet. <laughs> I, ha I had a couple of guests today that, that, that fell through and then I haven't, I haven't don't yet have a guest for out the close, but I will have a guest for out the close. I promise. I just don't have it booked yet, but I, but that's a project for today. Um, thanks for holding me accountable. Snap crackle pop. Uh, okay. Thanks, Matt. Thanks to everyone. I'm hopping off. Good luck at the open. We'll see you for uh, options. Explain with Robert Roy starting in a couple of minutes. The stream will redirect. So you don't even have to do anything. Good luck at the open. <laughs>